All right, everybody. I read, or if you want to say, heard the audiobook for Michael Anton's The Stakes America at the Point of No Return. He first came onto my radar because of his review, I believe, in the American Mind, although it could have been the Claremont Review of Books, of BAP, the Bronze Age Perverts Bronze Age Mindset Text, which I have also read the actual print book of and reviewed on this channel. I then looked into him a little bit more and read his kind of initial case for Trump back in 2016 that he titled Flight 93 that pissed a lot of people off and that he wrote under a pseudonym. Pseudonyms are one of his shticks as a part of the esoteric West Coast Straussian conservative school there represented by the Claremont Institute's uh, two wings there that I said, American Mind and the Claremont Review of Books, American Mind, more of a generic kind of, uh, you know, free reading, easier to read type of uh, publication for the masses and uh, interested in conservatism of a certain style or brand. And then the Claremont Review of Books, I imagine a conservative response to the LA Review of Books, to the New Yorker and other such publications. Anyway, he's pretty much a populist nationalist, and he's also a professor, I should mention, at Hillsdale College's DC, Washington, DC branch, where he teaches both undergraduate and graduate coursework. He's got uh, himself a master's degree from Claremont. And you know, he's a populist nationalist, maybe of the Tucker Carlson variety, if you want a Fox News equivalent. And so it means that I think he's horrible or terrible on many things, but there are a few things that he's pretty good on, which makes him, you know, far more tolerable than a lot of the other people. But uh, overall, he's very sure of a lot of his claims and statements being grounded in the founding documents of the United States. But when you push it, a lot of his argumentation is if you're being pejorative, arbitrary, and if you're being friendly, prudential. He uses the word prudence a lot. And there's a a sort of random element to it, a malleable element. In this sense, he's anti-ideological in the sense of, if you're looking for a conservative or libertarian thought, that is very free market oriented, you'll be disappointed in a lot of places. So I'll name a few places. One more thing before I name a few places in the book or themes or motifs. He's worked for Bush too, that is George W. Bush, as well as for the Trump administration. His stay with the Trump administration was very short. He was ousted along with his boss Flynn by Bolton and the warmongers. And this is actually, I think, his most sympathetic point. I sympathize with him the most because Bolton is a monster, just like Henry Kissinger was a monster. And Flynn and uh, you know Michael Anton could have probably done some better things on, on foreign policy. And I'll get to that at the end. But basically, he discusses foreign policy, trade slash tariffs, the so-called administrative state, the bureaucracies underneath the executive, which act as legislative branches, the many various regulations, some of which he's down with getting rid of, some of which he wants to add, and uh, education. And then he gives kind of a prediction of how things are going to happen. So let's begin with his prediction. He looks at states like New York and states like California, which have become pretty much one-party states in the dictatorial fashion of the pseudo democracies of you know Africa and um, and and elsewhere in 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 Asia as well. So he looks at those and he says, "This is what's going to happen to all of the United States," and that may or or may not be true. I'm not sure. And he presents kind of several options. And in his esotericism, he doesn't want to say which one he wants the most. But the option that is most intriguing, um, especially with his connections with BAP and his connections with Curtis Yarvin, is the idea of Caesarism, the idea of uh, the one-party state being dominated by Democrats, pushing and pushing and pushing Republicans to a point where eventually some sort of coup happens. He leaves that of one amongst four kind of options. 
Um, the one that he says he's for the most is actually Trump winning in 2020 and then Republicans of the populist nationalist variety continuing to win and continuing to get presence. And he says this is what he wants the most, but he might think that that is a losing battle and be voting more for the Caesarism. And it was something to reflect on, something to think about as you read his text, if you're interested. His education thoughts are very interesting. He wants to build boys' academies that focus on MMA, mixed martial arts, or I prefer to call them martial sciences or mixed uh, martial sciences. I have a five and a half years background of Taekwondo, three years background in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, and I want to get into Muay Thai next. So that's very fascinating, especially because I've been an educator for a number of years in university settings as well as K-12, to especially elementary school, and then especially first grade and, and fourth grade are the grades that I've taught the most. So that, that's very fascinating. He wants to teach uh, trade skills, which is a point Killer Mike has worked across the aisle, so to speak, in Atlanta. He's uh, more of a Bernie Democrat, and he's worked across the aisle with Republicans in, in the state of Georgia to try to get public schools to start teaching trade skills again, to have more home ec, although that's more you know for women traditionally, uh, more woodwork, more mechanics, more electricians, more plumbers. And so that's exciting part. And then he puts a huge emphasis, that is Michael Anton, on the great books of the Western canon. And he thinks having... Um, you know, institutions of your own private ones that teach in this manner would do a lot to make the Republic stronger. I, I actually agree on this point, although I would like to do more co-ed or maybe even also girls Academy. I don't, I don't see the idea of just separating for boys. I would like to teach both groups, but I think that's a great idea. Uh, in terms of regulations, he wants to strip a lot of regulations from the administrative state. So that's related to kind of the next point. Uh, but he also wants to use the regulatory arm of the bureaucracies to enforce safety measures, to uh, support kind of union work, and overall kind of support the American producer over the American consumer, which is a point that goes back to his tariffs as well, which I found disagreeable. And I think the examples of the sharing economy, the examples of Uber and Lyft, the examples of Airbnb and basically everything in the, the gig economy, the P2P economy, the sharing economy shows that it's not an argument of regulation versus deregulation. It's an argument of who's going to do the regulating. Should the regulating be democratized? Should it be in the hands of the consumer or should it be in the hands of unelected bureaucrats? And it seems like he inconsistently distrusts unelected bureaucrats to do some things but then he does not trust them in other categories. I, I would differ there and always distrust them and favor the people in terms of the regulation of businesses. Um, I think there's a great democratizing power and equalizing power that would be a, a greater check on business, big business especially, than would uh, bureaucrats who historically embed themselves with taxi monopolies, with hotel monopolies, with brick and mortar restaurant monopolies, you know, versus, you know, the small minority pop-up kind of food cart that we see a lot in South Central Los Angeles, or even the kind of more hipstery food trucks of, of various, you know, flavors of ethnic cuisine that we also see. So regarding trade, He's very tariff-minded. Um, now, tariffs come from the mercantilist age, and I really thought mercantilism was disproved. Um, you know, there's the great works by Frederick Bastiat, which are very much anti-tariff. The, the great works by Richard, that's the Frenchman, and then there's the Englishman Richard Cobden, who's blown up tariffs. So honestly, read Frederick Bastiat, read Richard Cobden, and you see that there's no reason to favor the producer over the consumer. Everyone is a consumer, not everyone is a producer. And so it's better to favor the consumer. And especially Bastiat ridicules this with a reductio ad absurdum, showing that candlestick makers would want to apply mercantilism to the sun itself because the sun is the greatest monopoly on light. And he shows really the ridiculousness of these arguments. Although I would accept the prudential argument for tariffs for a sovereign nation state 
if you then get rid of totally the administrative state. But he kind of wants to slash the administrative state a little bit, but keep parts of it to favor uh, the American producers. And I think that's going to backfire. So I think those two don't go together. Again, I'm I'm very anti-tariff, but I'm open to it if the trade-off is totally slashing the administrative state. Finally, he talks about foreign policy. And what's weird here, I'll start with the bad and then go to the good. The bad is he focuses a lot on China. He's very anti-China, but he goes kind of soft on Russia. He he mentions the great Russian composers uh, that Americans listen to in classical music. He mentions the great of Russian literature, uh, Dostoevsky, Leo Tolstoy, you know, Tchaikovsky for the composers, uh, Rachmaninoff, all these people. I love them. You know, it's an Orthodox country. I'm an Orthodox Christian. And although we split in 451, you know, we're more or less the same. So I love, you know, the Russians, but he's pretending as if the kind of Russian foreign policy doesn't have an interest in being a world hegemon. I would argue it's Russia, China, and the United States. He thinks that if America stops being the hegemon or the hegemon, that China's the only party that's going to step in. I would say, watch out for Russia, even though I love them. Watch out for Russia, even though I could appreciate, you know, some Kung Fu flicks. Um, but overall, the great things about him is he's the most anti-war, populist, nationalist, conservative Republican who has you know worked for the Bush regime and Trump regime that I have seen. Of all the people who've actually been a, a member you know that close to the actual power, to the belly of the beast in DC, he's the most anti-war that I've seen. He would pull back the troops a lot. He still kind of has this machismo and wants to flex American might and his phraseology, I, I'm not comfortable with, you know, secure, the national security, the security interests of the United States. He uses all this language. I'm much more into the Jeffersonianism that says we don't need a standing military, um, kind of like a state, a nation state like Costa, Costa Rica. Um, and, I, and I would like to see uh, that area fleeced and, you know, the economy boosted, the people of the United States supported more once you slash foreign policy and i think the the old right conservatives and the new left the the serious sides of the left can agree and find room to have foreign policy i also think when you measure all other policies foreign policy is the most important because it is the greatest harm that the state does to the outside world um and you know, on a magnitude level, on a quantity, on a numbers level, foreign policy is the most important issue. Him being good, especially in comparison to other Republicans, other populist nationalists, other conservatives on foreign policy, makes the book worthwhile to read. But yeah, overall, frustrating on a number of issues. Um, but yeah, I recommend reading this book, engaging it. He's an intelligent guy. You'll learn English even reading it. There, there are several times I was sent to the dictionary with the English he uses. So he's an intelligent writer. He's written on fashion before, which is fascinating. Uh, a guy interested in foreign policy and fashion is rare. So shout out to him and do your own analysis as always. Don't just take my advice, but I hope that I give you breadcrumbs and a bread trail that will allow you to digest his work with a new eye and a new lens. Peace.